Call 67979081. Good morning, it is 98FM's Dublin Talks with Jeremy Dixon here for a Tuesday morning. And boy, have we got a busy show for you for over the next two hours. Disappointed to hear just there uh, that there's going to be showers later on. And I'll tell you why. Um, we bought a barbecue last summer. Remember last summer was amazing. Uh, it was just the best summer ever weather-wise. And we ended up having about 50 barbecues throughout the summer. And this year we haven't had one once. And uh, today I was actually planning, uh, I bought a load of stuff uh, in Lidl uh, yesterday and was planning on uh, cooking a few burgers and and steaks on the barbecue. And now you hear it's going to rain. You can't plan anything in this country. That's the one thing that annoys me. You can't plan anything because of the weather. It's so unpredictable. Anyway, I won't go on about it uh, much more. Now, I have a question for you. I want to do a social experiment and find out how popular online shopping is. Okay, so there's thousands of you listening to the show right now, okay? But how many of you have bought something online in the last six months, okay? So I want you to think about that. In the last six months, or even a year, between six months and a year, how much have you bought online? What did you buy and what website did you buy it from? I'll explain why I'm asking that in a moment. But I know a lot of you listening uh, do your shopping online at the moment. Uh, you know, if you're buying clothes or if you're buying uh, footwear, if you're buying electronics, you'll buy that stuff online. But how popular is online shopping amongst Dubliners? Text or WhatsApp me right now. 87 That number again, 87 9898. That is the text or WhatsApp number. It's a simple question. In the last six months, have you bought something online? If so, what was it and what website did you buy it from? Now, the reason I'm asking this is because if you are an online shopper and you buy stuff on ASOS or Boohoo or Pretty Little Things and the girls in here, not so much the men, but the girls in here are regularly getting packages delivered to the men work. Uh, they buy all their clothes uh, online, it appears. But have you thought about how Brexit could impact your shopping habits? So you're buying clothes off, you know, uh, Boohoo, which I, as far as I know is based uh, in the UK, or you're buying stuff uh, on ASOS, which I believe is also uh, based in the UK, as is Amazon. You know, all is well and good now at the moment because you're buying from within the EU. Uh, but after Brexit kicks in, could this impact your shopping habits? And could you be faced with a nasty shock when you buy a dress on Boohoo or Amazon and it arrives in the post and you get a bill uh, saying that you owe duty uh, because you're buying from with, with outside the EU? So text or WhatsApp me, 87 uh, Just as a social experiment, what have you bought online in the last six months? What was it and where did you buy it from? Figures out today uh, show that, uh, well, Irish shoppers love buying stuff off UK websites. The Competition for Consumer Protection uh, Commission is launching an awareness campaign to prepare people like yourself and myself for the impact of Brexit. And uh, joining us on the line is Anya Carroll, who's the Director of Communications for the CCPC. Firstly, Anya, uh, I was reading your story today with great interest as someone who buys stuff uh, online myself. And your stats show that uh, Irish consumers are big online shoppers in the UK market. But just how big? Yeah, so we've done some research into the I suppose, shopping habits of, of consumers in Ireland. Um, and what we found was that 72% of consumers in Ireland have bought from a UK-based retailer online in the past two years which is a really sizable, you know, um, majority of the Irish population. But really interestingly, what we found is that almost a third of consumers had bought from UK-based retailers more than 10 times in the last two years. And that's particularly high among consumers uh, in the 18 to 24-year-old category. So there's a huge amount of online shopping going on um, in Ireland um, with UK-based uh, websites. And sorry, um, what, are, what are people buying? Is it clothing? Is it electronics? Yeah, so the first two there, yeah, clothing. So 60% of people said they had bought clothes um, from UK-based retailers in the the last two years. And then it was followed by electronics. 30% of people had bought electronics and 20% of people had bought footwear. And then the real mix of pretty much everything you would think that people would buy, they are buying online. Um, And we've 
got really strong consumer protection under EU law when we shop online. So if you buy from a website that's based anywhere in the EU, that includes currently the UK, you have what's known as a 14-day cooling off period. So once the goods are actually delivered to you, you have 14 days to decide whether you want to keep them. And that's different from when you shop in a, in a bricks and mortar kind of retailer because you don't have that right under the law. Um, and then you have a further 14 days under EU rules to return the goods to the retailer um, and to get a refund uh, for any reason. There are a couple of exceptions to this, like kind of common sense things like if you get something customised, you're not going to be able to return it. But for the vast majority of things that we buy online, we have this right. Um, and if you think about it, it was kind of designed to make sure that consumers all over the EU could shop from businesses all over the EU and to kind of create that single market. And sorry, Anya, how do I know? I do a lot of shopping online. I buy a lot of stuff. Uh, 50%, I would imagine, of the stuff I buy now is online. How do you know when you're shopping on a website, say, for instance, ASOS or Pretty Little Things or whatever, how do you know that that website is in fact based within the EU and thereby you are covered by, by the laws? So on anywhere on a website, and I would say really one thing that's really important is not to be guided by the, you know, dot, 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 .ie, dot, co, dot, uk because websites can have multiple, um, they can have multiple, say, web addresses even though they are based in a particular location. So when you go onto the website, usually somewhere in the footer, you're actually going to have a link and that's going to give you the address of the company. And that actual physical address is what determines whether you have those EU rights or you don't have those EU rights. The other thing is if you read the terms and conditions, you'll see a reference if, you have a, if it's in the EU to what's called the Consumer Rights Directive. And that directive is the name of the piece of, that's the piece of law that actually gives you these rights. So it's called the Consumer Rights Directive. If that's not referenced, then it's unlikely that you actually do have those rights or if the website's outside the EU, you're not going to have those rights. So currently, if you buy from a website that's based, say, in the US or based in China, what I suppose is relevant there is the terms and conditions or the actual policy of the website when it comes to things like returns. So very often, if you buy from a US-based website, you're not going to be able to return it. So you have, you know, you have that experience of kind of going, well, I'm going to be absolutely sure that I'm going to want to keep it when it arrives. Okay, so part of the peace of mind from a consumer point of view from, you know, from the likes of myself and a lot of the girls I work with, they shop weekly on these uh, clothing stores, these European clothing stores, is that you know if you're buying from a European-based uh, website that you are going to be protected by these laws. So what will, of course, this is where Brexit comes in, what will Brexit mean for people like myself, like yourself, uh, like for all the people listening who shop on these websites that may be based in the UK? So this is where I suppose it gets a little bit complicated. And, you know, a lot of things I suppose are uncertain in relation to Brexit. But one thing is, is certain is that once the UK leaves, there will be changes of some sort. So if you look at, I suppose, from, a, from the perspective of, well, will that law exist in the UK after the UK leaves the EU? No, it won't, because it's, it's European law, and those laws will not be implemented straight away in the UK. So those rights that you currently have will not be guaranteed by EU law. Um, of course, some retailers in the UK may decide that they're going to keep all of the provisions of that legislation and make it their terms and conditions and make it their policies but the point is policies can change and it can be very hard to rely on policies if something goes wrong versus what you have currently which are rights that are guaranteed by EU law so it is really important for for us all as consumers to first of all I suppose just consider the impact of of, of Brexit when it happens to make sure that when we're shopping online that we understand the geographical location of the retailer that we're buying from and if that retailer is not in the EU, that we understand that we need to take a quick look to see what would happen in the event of, of you wanting to return something. And also things like who pays for the cost of returning items, who pays for the postage, to sort of satisfy ourselves with all that information but before we buy. Um, and I suppose the other factor then to, to understand for people is that when you buy from outside the EU, everyone's had the experience of buying something from outside the EU and the postman comes to the door with a bill for uh, for VAT and, yes, and for yeah. excise duty. That will be the case for UK-based retailers once the UK leaves the EU. They will be treated exactly the same okay. way as retailers in China or in Australia or in the US. That's interesting because a couple of years ago when uh, I got married, friends of ours who live in the States sent us over a wedding present and it arrived at the door. Uh, the postman uh, was holding it there and he said, I can only give this to you when you pay, I think it was 120 euro or whatever. And um, I was obviously, I was taken aback by it. And I said, what's this for? And he said, well, it's the duty on it. And he wouldn't hand over that item uh, until, I, until I paid 120 euro. So are you saying this could, this could possibly happen where I buy a pair of Nike runners on a website uh, based in the UK yep. and uh, they arrive on 
at my door and they will not be handed over to me until I pay the duty on it. Exactly. It's exactly the same way as a, as a, um, um, a retailer from Australia or the US or China. Um, so this, be, this is a big deal, isn't it, for, for it Irish is, consumers? It is a big deal, it is. And look, I mean, at the, a lot of UK-based uh, websites have been, you know, really kind of ahead of this. They've, you know, they've set up uh, websites in other parts of the EU so that it can kind of continue to trade within the EU um, on the basis of that single market. Um, and I think that's the most important thing for consumers, you know, regardless of, kind of what happens, I suppose, over the next couple of months with Brexit, when you are shopping online, first of all, make sure that you understand uh, where that website is based and you can go onto our website which is ccpc.ie and you can find out the differences between shopping within the EU and outside the EU um, and how that might impact on things like returns and, and the cost of goods. So what are you advising in the next, in the coming months, what are you advising Irish customers to do in a post-Brexit situation and um, where can they get the right information? How how do they know? How does Joanne, listening at home, who's going to buy her dress uh, for her Christmas party, and I know Christmas is a long way away, but she could be buying her, her dress for a Christmas party in November on one of these UK-based clothing websites, uh, where can she go to, to get the right information so she's not going to be stiffed with a bill uh, or due, for duty when it arrives at her house? So when you're shopping online and you're lo- looking at a particular website, the most important thing is the geographical location of the website. So as I said, ignore to a certain extent the, the, the web address, whether it's .co.uk or .com. You really need to check where the website is actually located. And if you can't find that information, send them an email and ask them. Uh, and ask them whether you have those rights under the Consumer Rights Directive. Um, so you may have to dig around in the website a little bit to find out the, the physical location of the website. If it's not within the EU, then you really need to read the terms and conditions on the website and particularly any information around returns. Because when you buy something like a dress, you really have no idea whether you're going to want to keep it until it actually arrives. And if you don't have that automatic right that's currently enshrined under EU law to return something, then you are going to be relying on the terms and conditions on the website. Um, So you really need to read those. And that is the most important thing, is to arm yourself that information as a consumer before you spend your money. Anya Carroll, thanks very much for joining us on 98FM's Dublin Talks. And it's interesting, the text coming in, uh, a lot of you do shop online, uh, and that's, this is something to be wary of. This is going to happen. This is not a scaremongering. Uh, you heard it there from, from Ona or herself. You could get faced with a nasty bill when your address arrives from uh, one of these websites. I was asking you to text in um, about what websites you buy on and uh, what sorts of stuff you buy. So keep those texts coming in. 87 98 I've got a lot of DVDs on Amazon UK. Um, as I can't get those DVDs in Irish shops, says uh, one texter. Um, I buy literally everything online, says another person, uh, aside from consumables. Um, I even buy whiskey online, uh, says that person. Steve, you work for a or you you work for a courier company, is that correct? Yeah, that uh, delivers all those uh, brands that you mentioned, Jeremy. Yeah. Also, ASOS, Boohoo, Pretty Little Pretty Things, little Misguided, Happy Girl, all those Little Woods, all those carry on. Uh, all, all which are, are they all based in the UK? Uh, most of them, yeah. They're all based around Manchester. Uh, a lot of them are owned by the same company. I think Pretty Little King is owned by Miss Guided and uh, Bill Hill is owned by somebody else as well. So, And they all have the same boards. But uh, I know our company has been talking to ASOS and those. And if it gets really messy, they're talking about opening up a warehouse over here. Oh, they actually are? Okay. Um, so, that's if it gets really bad. So, they don't know what... They, they can't make any decisions at the moment, obviously, because we don't know what's going to happen. But after the 31st, if it gets really bad, and of course, it's going to be peak season then for them coming up to Black Friday. It's going to be really messy. Uh, so, they were talking about even, yeah, opening a warehouse over here to get around the EU laws. Okay, well, that would be actually... It would be brilliant, because I would imagine that would affect uh, their business, and it'll affect your business as well, uh, if... Yeah. Absolutely, a big time, because I can tell you, for the last 10 years, 30%, year on year, it's grown. Really? It's, it's, yeah. it's, that, it's that popular, is it? That, I don't know how shops are open, Jeremy, to be quite honest with you. The, but the one thing I've always wondered, though, is how these companies like Boohoo and Misguided stay in business, because a lot of people I know that get clothes from them, uh, they'll have a look at them and then decide to send them back. Uh, and I, I would imagine the returns uh, are quite big, are they? Amazing, yeah. You could the, the lads could easily pick up two hundred packages in each of the shops. They go around the shops on Mondays, and they they could have two hundred packages from each shop, from girls dropping them back to pick up points. You know. 
So there is a lot of returns, but I can promise you they're working on this. They they have not they, they really don't like those the amount of returns coming back. They know girls wear dresses and keep the tags on and send them back. They are aware of all that. And actually, as far as I know, Zara are talking about looking. I don't know how they're going to do this, but they're looking at DNA and everything. Really? Because there's so much going back. Yeah, because obviously, if they, if actually, you know what, I'll take a picture of the depot on Monday morning next week for you, Jeremy, and yeah. I'll show you the melt or a Yeah, do I'd be fascinated because all, oh, all yeah. I know is from my, my friends and family members, they they'll go online uh, before parties come up and they buy ten dresses on on ASOS or whatever, and they'll send nine of them back and just hold on to one of them, which is which is crazy. Um, so I don't know yeah, how but, this. Uh, can I just tell the people out there, you get nothing for nothing. When they say there's a free return service, it's getting put onto the price of the dress. Yeah, of course. You know what I mean? So, or whatever you're buying. So, you're not getting free returns. So, don't think that. And now I know you're getting a deal and it's probably still cheaper than the shops, but the old saying, you get nothing for nothing. But what you're saying is a lot of these websites, well, they obviously knew Brexit was coming. It's been coming for the last few years and they yeah. have they have plans in place so we may not get be stiffed. We may not be stiffed with those bills. Well, some of them have head offices here in Enio, so we might be able to get around it with that. I don't know. But they're, 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 they're prepared. Okay. They don't know what's going to happen, obviously. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, Nobody ho- does. Nobody does. Hopefully they are. Thank you very much for your call, Stephen. That's interesting coming from a courier's point of view. Uh, they're absolutely out the door. Um, I know, in fairness, we knew that... It, People were buying. I mean, in this building alone, where you have uh, a couple of hundred staff, uh, in the run up to Christmas, November, from October to November, literally parcels are arriving uh, by the hour uh, with clothing and footwear and stuff like that and electronics and presents. My own wife, she looks after the Christmas presents uh, every year and she buys most of the stuff online, I have to say, um, because she can sit at home, uh, do it all on the computer, and it arrives uh, the next day. And a lot of it is from. UK based websites but it'll be interesting to see what happens but you heard it here first we're giving you the heads up that if you do shop on these websites uh, just beware that uh, post, in a post Brexit situation you were literally buying stuff from outside the EU and uh, you could be faced with, uh, with a duty uh, tariff on it which wouldn't be nice you know you're getting your dress nice and cheap and then all of a sudden they add this onto the bill and the postman won't hand it over to you until you pay the bill uh, I buy uh, all of my clothes uh, online says this texture I haven't been in a shop in years um, it's so hand- so much handier buying uh, stuff online uh, my daughter's buy their, their clothes online as well uh, it's the only way to go I constantly buy uh, says this text from Lauren from Amazon I have Amazon Prime so I don't currently get charged delivery charges but every week I buy from Amazon it is great and for all you people who buy online yeah it is great as well but remember as well that you should uh, pop into your local shops as well and you know uh, because these are the shops that are employing uh, local people employing people that live in your area so you know when you go into into uh, Henry Street or Grafton Street and go into uh, the shop to buy a shirt or whatever the person working there um, you know they rely on you shopping there as well so you know maybe you can balance the two shop online uh, and shop locally as well it's 98 FM's Dublin Talks don't go away something very interesting and important for you after the break the sound of the city from Balbriggan to Blanchardstown Dublin Talks 98 FM's Dublin Talks it's Jeremy Dixon here with you until midday today with Tuesday's edition of 98 FM's Dublin Talks now a topic that is quite close to my heart is something that I, I harp on about quite a bit on this show, and that is prostate cancer. And I have a question for you uh, listening uh, at the moment. Uh, for the men, uh, have you gone for a prostate exam in the last couple of years? I want you to be honest and open with me, OK, because... Uh, it's something that men need to talk about. I don't know if you remember on the show about a year ago, uh, I went after putting it off for years and years and my wife hassling me uh, and pushing me to try and go. I finally, uh, about a year ago, went and uh, got a prostate exam. I uh, went for the physical prostate exam um, and uh, recorded it for the show and played it on the show. And it, it did, it raised, it raised a bit of awareness and a lot of men who listened to the show ended up, after hearing it, they ended up going and get the exam, getting the exam done themselves. But there are a lot of men who don't go for uh, a prostate exam. So I want to hear from you. Text or WhatsApp me on 87 98 87 uh, Particularly if you're a man who's in his 40s. This is, the, this is directed at you. Or a woman who's married to someone. Um, has your husband or have you 
been for a prostate exam. The Marie Keating Foundation have uh, launched a new awareness campaign called Stand Up uh, for Your Prostate. Uh, And it aims to remove the stigma surrounding the disease and encourage those at risk to get themselves checked out. Now, how big of a problem is prostate cancer in Ireland? Well, 330 Irish men die from prostate cancer every single year in Ireland. That is a huge, huge figure. And of course, a lot of that could be prevented with early detection. 330 Irish men. Just think about that for a moment. So what we want to know on the show today is, why do you think men are hesitant to get checked out? Do you know someone who has had prostate cancer uh, who survived it? How important is it to get checked out? Joining me now on the line from the Marie Keating Foundation is CEO Liz Yates. You're very welcome along to 98FM, Liz. Thank you, Jeremy. Now, as I mentioned in my introduction there, it's something that's that's close to my heart. It's something I put off for uh, years and years and years. Uh, my wife was constantly, uh, I wouldn't say nagging, because nagging is the wrong word, because she only had my, my health... Uh, Influencing, in, in, I'm sure. Yeah, but she, she kept on, and I finally gave in uh, last year and uh, went and got it done, and it was a load off my mind. Thankfully, it was a, it was a positive uh, result. So why this, why this campaign? Well, I suppose we we want um, the campaign to empower Irish men to be more open and comfortable about discussing their health. Um, something like the breast campaign, I think if you see women talk more openly about their health that are more breast aware and I suppose um, more willing to, to consult each other and ask questions of each other. And we know from our research that men are so comfortable talking about their work, their favourite sports, football, whatever. Um, But the evidence is that they don't actually talk about health. And this campaign called Stand Up For Your Prostate um, is really about encouraging men to talk, first of all, and then to act as well by going to see their GP if they have any concerns, particularly if you're over 45 and if there is any kind of a family history. Um, you might be a little bit more um, susceptible to something like prostate cancer. Uh, So I suppose even asking questions of your own family members who may have passed on in the past, was there prostate cancer previously? Because if, if a father or a brother or an uncle has had prostate cancer, then um, any man is two and a half times more likely to, to get it. And there seems to be a difference between male and females uh, in that females tend to look after themselves a lot better than males do when it comes to their their health. You know, women will go and get all the checks that they're supposed to do. uh, But men, they they shy away. They shy away from these checks and they don't talk about it. I mean, I've been out with my mates on so many occasions uh, in the pub or at social events and it has never come up. Well, sorry, the first time it came up as a conversation was when I went and actually got the test uh, done a year ago because they'd obviously heard it on the radio. But it's not something us men uh, talk about. So how do we change that? How do we get men? And hopefully this... And talk- that's what this type of campaign is, is aiming to achieve. So at the Marie Keating Foundation, um, we would very much focus on the importance of early detection and particularly with prostate cancer, um, advances in treatment mean that now 91% of men come out the other side even if they are diagnosed provided it's caught early you have a very strong chance of being treated well and coming out the other side and that's why early detection is so important and that's why you know, we're encouraging men to talk about it. If you're over 50, you should be going to, for an annual GP checkup. Um, and it, I mean, you've been through the prostate cancer or the prostate examination. It's it's a, a little bit like a smear test for a woman. Yeah. It's not pleasant, but look, it takes a few minutes and it could save your life. That is our message. Now, the one thing, um, the one conf- the bit of confusion that I got last time we we discussed this was, and there seems to be a bit of confusion about the examination I- itself. Now, I know you're going to coming at it from a medical point of view but a lot of men um, don't realise that there's a bl- that you can go for a blood test it doesn't have to be a physical a physical test isn't that yes, correct? So, so the PSA test is is, well, is monitoring um, the levels of PSA in your blood and that if that is escalating or going going up your your GP will then at a certain point may may recommend uh, uh, you know to do a, an examination as well as the PSA test But the first step will be the PSA test and uh, that's simply a blood test and it's something, a a marker in your blood that will be looked at by your GP and if the levels are normal, 
you know, you'll be sent away and asked to come back again another year. In, in, other, in other words, the first test is a blood test, which is like, it's a prick. Uh, that's all you need. It's just exactly. a little prick. Um, and, you know, if that comes back uh, well and good, you don't have to go for the physical. It's, you only need to go for the physical exam. Now, I went for the physical exam uh, just for my own, my own uh, sake. And if there is a family history, we yeah. would sometimes recommend that, you know, that in tandem with the PSA test would be recommended as well. But, you know, for your average 45, 50 year old, you know, just a simple blood test will give the initial PSA reading. And, you know, what could be as as simple as a a simple blood test, you know. Um, So we've had the Marie Keating Foundation is very fortunate this year to have um, six men who uh, have come on board as our ambassadors and are urging other men to to talk about their health, to watch and to act. Uh, so Tony O'Donoghue, the RTE radio or new, uh, soccer correspondent, Matt Cooper, Today FM, and yes, Virgin yeah, Media presenter, that. Tony Ward, the rugby legend, um, and Senator Neil Richmond. Um, each of those have, have, have spoken to other men in their lives and have done videos, which are now on our website, talking about the importance of um, prostate health and of talking about your health. And in many of their cases, um, they ha- they have had direct uh, they've had direct a uh, direct link with prostate cancer. So uh, Tony Ward had it. He developed that himself, and he talks openly about the fact that he kind of saw the symptoms but did nothing about it until it was quite late. But thankfully, he is through his treatment now, and he's here to tell the story. And in Matt Cooper's case and Tony O'Donoghue's case, both their fathers had prostate cancer. So they now recognise that they are at an elevated uh, risk of developing prostate cancer themselves. Um, And they have have got themselves checked out. And Tony O'Donoghue unfortunately went on to develop a different type of cancer, which was detected by the makeup lady in RTE. Oh, I remember hearing that story, uh, yeah. Yeah, he had a, a lump on his neck and she noticed it and pointed it out to him. And again, because of his father's history, Tony went along to the GP and uh, he ended up uh, going through cancer treatment. But again, is is here to, te- to tell the story about the importance of early detection. And that's what it is. It is early detection. Liz, I wish you the best of luck with it with the campaign. It's something that, as I said, is very close to, to our hearts here. Thanks very much for joining us on 98 FM. That's uh, Liz Yates, CEO of the Marie Kemp, Marie Keating Foundation. What she wants to do is what we want to do is get men talking uh, about prostate cancer. Have you been for the uh, exam? Do you how regularly do you get it checked? Do you know someone who has suffered with, with prostate cancer? It is so so important. Women talk about their health all the time. Men need to do it as well. Uh, text or WhatsApp us 87 or call us on six seven nine seven ninety eight. One. Greg, you're on 98 FM. How are you? Morning, how are you? I'm not too bad. Isn't it great to hear men talking uh, openly about stuff like this? It's so important, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think men should really get their finger out, if you the pun. Yeah, no, but that's... Start talking th- about this. Yes. Uh, now, yourself, what's your situation yourself? Uh, well, I turned 35 last April, and ever since my 33rd birthday, I've been going every year. Really? E- every year? Yeah, well, I've been twice. I've had my third one coming up. It's, you know what I mean? The first one was a bit scary. After that, it's it's, 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 it's easy. Yeah, you know it's, I mean? it's because it's the unknown, isn't it? You don't know what yeah. the... And yeah, did, you, exactly. did you go for the blood test or the physical test? Just the physical. Yeah, and it's, you know what, it's it's all over in, what, 10 seconds, pretty much? Yeah, yeah. So you go in, doctor checks you, and then he goes, yep, you're clear, and you're you're... It's allowed off your mind for another year. Like. Absolutely. I was, I'll be honest, I was terrified a year ago going in because, you know, I'd never been checked before and I was like, I'm after putting this on on the long finger uh, for, for way, way too long. And after I came out of the exam, which was literally, as you said, 10 minutes, I was like, my God, why did I put that off for so long? It wasn't that big of a deal. Yeah. Big, big, big deep breath when you come out and you just feel so much better. Like. You do. Thanks very much for your call, Greg. 67979981 is our telephone number. Text or WhatsApp your comments to 0877 98 98 98. And let me read out this message from uh, Sive. And she says, I can't believe you're talking about this today. I was just at my husband over the weekend to go and get his prostate checked. He's 46 and seems to think that it, he doesn't need to get it checked. 
He says it's not important at his age. Part of me thinks he's just nervous about the exam, but he's so stubborn. How can I convince him to go? Help, please. Uh, says Sive. Well, we like to help uh, people, especially people uh, like yourself who are uh, who don't know who to turn to. So let me just get a, a load of her message again. So her husband is 46. Uh, she's constantly at him to go and get his prostate checked, as my wife was with me. Uh, he seems to think that he doesn't need to get it checked uh, as it's not an, he's not at the age where it's important. Part of me thinks he's just nervous about the exam, uh, but he's so stubborn. How can I convince him? That is a fair question, Sive. Does anybody have an answer uh, to that? How can Sive convince her 46-year-old husband to go and get his prostate uh, checked? What do you do if your partner just keeps on putting it off and keeps on saying no? If anybody has any advice uh, for Sive, because uh, she can't keep, she can't drag him along. You can't drag a 46-year-old man along to the doctors. You know, he's not a child. So how does she convince her husband that he needs to get this test. If you have any advice for Sive, text or WhatsApp us 0877 98 98 98. Uh, Bob, you get checked once a year as well, do you? I do, yeah, because my older brother was diagnosed there a couple of years ago. He was in the office there. But um, even before that, I was passing blood and for years, like, and they, they kept a check on me anyway, you know. But, um, yeah, definitely, it's a time with their story about how it's going to go. I mean... Just go into your own GP or into one of the hospitals and there's plenty of leaflets and that type of stuff and just leave the leaflets where you can see it and get them to read it, basically. So in your brother's situation, um, had he been going for regular tests or did it just come out no, of the blue? No, it was just through sheer luck. He was in for something else and they were they just ran a test for some reason and they found it. Wow. Um, but yeah, it was... It was it sheer was a, luck. Was it, all, was it detected early, was it? It was, yeah, yeah. And had so he, not, he's, he goes back every year now, and um, thank God everything seems to be hunky dory, you know. So now, had that not happened with your brother, do you think you would be as uh, as diligent when it comes to getting uh, the prostate? Well, in, in fairness, like I said, you, I was bleeding through <laughs> where I shouldn't have been bleeding for years, and I mean for years. And they did every test under the sun to find out what it was, and they tore down the polyps and all other sort of stuff, like you know. Because that is the one thing um, that if you see blood coming out of there, um, yeah. you know yeah. that that is a, a warning sign straight away. Did you go to the doctor straight away when you when you saw that? I did, but in fairness, now um, I mean it was every every time you went to the toilet, it wasn't just once in the blue mirror. I mean every time you went, and there was quite a lot of blood. Oh my god, that must have been terrible. Yeah, that yeah. must have been terrifying yeah. for you. But to be honest with you, I just got used to it. I know that sounds bad, but I just yeah. got used to it. So what would your advice be uh, for Sive? How does she make her 46-year-old husband get a prostate uh, exam? Well, as I said to you, go to a GP or go to the local the local hospital and get as much paperwork as you can and leave it around the house and then he will read it really, really eventually. Thanks very much for your call, Bobby. 67979811. Text or WhatsApp your comments to 0877989898. You can also send a WhatsApp voice note to that number like uh, this person did who wants to stay anonymous. Hi, Jeremy. Cancer runs in, in our family. We've lost a lot of members to it. Uh, I'm 42 and it plays, does play heavy on my mind to get a check, but I'm absolutely petrified about getting it done. There's absolutely nothing to be petrified about. I can't say this this enough to that person. You know, you're right at that age where you should be getting... Now, I'm not giving out medical advice. I'm not a medical uh, expert. But I do know that at your age, it is something that you should uh, be doing. Uh, Mick says, I'm 28. Uh, should I be getting it checked? No, I think that age, uh, they wouldn't recommend at that young unless there is a history uh, of prostate cancer in your family. Darren, I'm going to come to you. Uh, after the, the break uh, you were told at 42 you were too young to get it done yeah by three doctors ok that's interesting stay there for a second 67979981 text or whatsapp your comments to 0877989898 I'd love to hear from women as well because this isn't just a man's problem because Sive uh, is coming at it from the point of view where her husband uh, can't get it done how does someone like Sive if you are in that position that my wife was in that Sive was in that your husband just refuses to get it done how do you deal with that let's try and get some help for Sive 67979981 text or whatsapp 87 98 and we'll hear uh, after the break why three doctors 
wouldn't let Darren get it done. The sound of the city from Clondalkin to Clontarf. Dublin Talks. 98 FM's Dublin Talks. Uh, it's 98 FM's Dublin Talks with Jeremy Dixon here for a mid, until midday today for this uh, Tuesday's edition of Dublin Talks. We're talking about uh, the campaign by the Marie Keating Foundation who we were speaking to about 20 minutes ago on the show called Stand Up For Your Prostate. Uh, this is, well, it's to raise awareness uh, of the importance of getting a, a prostate exam. And it's great to hear on this show uh, this morning. It's great to hear so many men opening up about something uh, to do with their health because, as I said, to us men, we just shut down uh, when it comes to discussions about our own health. And it is disappointing. I'm just looking through the messages to see so many men uh, texting us in who just won't come on air because they're embarrassed about talking about this. That is absolutely ridiculous. You shouldn't be embarrassed about it because I can guarantee if this was a conversation about breast cancer, no woman will be embarrassed about coming on and talking about this. This is what we need to do. We need to break down the taboo around men talking about their health. What the bloody hell is wrong with you talking about a prostate exam? I've spoken about it regularly on the show. There's nothing to be ashamed or embarrassed about. We all have a prostate. This is about your health and this is about keeping you alive and it's about early det- detection. We're also talking about Sive's uh, issue. Uh, her 46-year-old husband uh, won't go. He's refusing to go and get it done. Uh, he says it's not important. Uh, and she says uh, she doesn't know what to do. How can she convince him to go? If you have, have any advice, text her WhatsApp us 87 Avril, I'll come to you in a second, but let me go to Darren first. Um, because uh, at 42 years of age, you went to get it done. Is that right, Darren? Uh, well, I went about, well, no, I'm 42 now. I went when I was about 40. Okay, so 40 years of age, and you took it upon yourself to go and get, uh, get an exam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to three different doctors, and three different doctors told me I was too young. You had me in your 50s. Really? Yeah. And did you insist that you get it done? Did you? Did they ask? Did, did they honestly just believe them? They're doctors. You believe doctors. No, because I'm just looking at uh, the cancer.ie website and it says um, you can you have the option of having a PSA test from the age of 40. So you were at the age... Um, that you could get it done if you have no family history and are not in a high risk group. Uh, many doctors feel that it's best to discuss the possibility of a PSA test from the age of 50. But I can't see what harm it would have done. Did they give a reason other than your age? No, that, that was it. Just because I went down with different problems with cramps all in the stomach. And we just asked for them. And he said, No, no, you're too young for that. So, so then I went to another doctor and because I still had the same problem. Two years later, I still had the same problem with my stomach. So I would say see a specialist now out in Vincent's and I'm waiting for that over a year. I don't know if anybody has the answer to that. I know what happened to a friend of mine as well. He was he was quite upset about it. He went for a, like yourself, he went for a full body check and um, said to the doctor when he was getting the body check, would you check for my prostate as well? And the doctor said, no, uh, you're too young. I don't know why a doctor would refuse you uh, something like that. Uh, I, think, I, think, I think some doctors do are, are more embarrassed than people. I think, no, I don't think doctors get embarrassed about stuff like that. No? Freedom of they wouldn't even talk about it. Really? But I've, but I've got to. You just get no blatantly, no, we're too young. That was it. That's very, frustra- no. that's very frustrating uh, that you would go and ask three different doctors uh, for, for assistance and not one of them would, would help you. And have you, you're now 42. Have you had it done oh, since? No, no. That's what I'm saying. I haven't had it at all. Now, I didn't know you could get a blood test and say, I got a blood test there about, about a year, about a year ago. I don't know if you've done it then. Yeah, you can get a blood test done which checks your PSA levels and if they're if they're low, uh, you won't need the physical test. That's my understanding. So uh, maybe go to another doctor. Uh, in fact, try and do that in the next week and get back on to us, Darren, and let us yeah, know. Well, I was back in the doctor at half 11. Oh, well, there you go. Oh, well, there, well, there you go. Well, will you do me a favour and ring us tomorrow morning and let us know how you get on? But, it, you, you know, you should be insistent with them and say, listen, I want this, I want this done. Um, and, yeah. just, and just get the blood test for it. But let us know tomorrow how it goes, OK? Yeah, OK, thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Darren. That is bizarre. If anybody has an answer to that, because I don't have an answer. I don't understand uh, how a doctor, how three doctors would turn away a man uh, who's 40 years of age and who wants uh, to get uh, the prostate exam and that three doctors would say uh, no to him. That just seems bizarre. Here's a WhatsApp voice note from Roshi. Jeremy, can I ask you, do you just go to your regular doctor for a prostate exam or is it somebody else? Thanks. Yes, you just go to your your local GP. Uh, I think most GPs do it. That's uh, who did my one. Um, So yeah, if it's it's obviously your husband or your partner you're asking on behalf of Roshi 
Um, so yes, do go to uh, your local GP. Let me go to uh, Avril. How are you, Avril? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm not too bad. Uh, your dad was diagnosed with prostate cancer, is that right? He was, yeah, five years ago. And what age was he when he was diagnosed? Uh, 64. 64, okay. And yeah. had he been getting regular tests? He gets blood tests every year. He- um, so it was just a regular blood test again that showed up the PSA level was high. Um, the the PSC was higher or something and then they brought it back and if the number is under three, I think you have to, you don't even have to get a test and you're, you know straight away you do have that. And obviously um, the, the PSA levels came back quite high, did they? Uh, yeah, it was something like that. I can't really remember its time. All I know is that it wasn't like, he didn't go in looking for a prostate test. It actually came up in his regular blood test. So for the people who were like, oh, I don't want to go and get that done, you can actually, it does come up in your regular blood test, as far as I'm aware. And when he was diagnosed, it was a, it was an early, they caught it early, did they? They caught it early and he had treat, he started his treatment then. And then just a few months ago, um, he got the all clear. Oh, that's brilliant. Uh, yeah. I'm sure that was but, a, lo- a load off his mind and your mind as well. Oh, absolutely. Like they kind of knew after the first year that it was going good because the doctor will keep telling them, look, we can see it and it's, it's looking good. That's what he kept saying. It's looking good. Um, but you can't say it until after the five years is up. Um, but if he, oh, he didn't, as I said, he didn't go for a prostate check. He just went for a regular blood check. Sure. And it came and up. This came up. And then I think he did get it um, checked out. Then the next time we went back to the doctor and then it went on from there. So you can actually go get the blood test if you don't want to go down the other road. Absolutely, and that's a lot of confusion that people have. I had that confusion myself up until last year that you can just go for the blood test. It's just a prick on the finger or whatever. You don't, that's it. Uh, you know, you don't need to uh, to, to get the uh, the physical uh, examination. Thanks very much for sharing your story with us, Avril. The best of luck to your uh, father. Um, a couple of your text messages here. Uh, Dan says, uh, I just booked a prostate exam thanks to uh, Jeremy. Well, it's not thanks to me, Dan. It's uh, I'm just here uh, doing a radio show show but that's what we're trying to do you know if 10 men uh listening to the show today book uh, a prostate exam uh, then that's a job well done another text message i just booked uh, a prostate exam uh, with my doctor for monday i'm dave 43 years of age well done to you dave jay the last call on this you've been putting off uh, like many men putting off getting the exam for a long time have you well for a few months now anyway have you ever had one no never and why can i ask you well, I've noticed that when I'm going to the bathroom, you know, past the more. Yes. It's, it doesn't seem to be like the pressure there was when I was a kid, you know what I mean? Okay. There's no pressure behind that as such. And you, that, that was worrying you, was it? Yeah, yeah. It's been getting to me for a while now, and I've been putting it off and putting it off, you know? And after today's conversation, do you think you will book yourself in for... I think I will for the PSA test. Yes, just get the, get the bloods done. Uh, and as I said, they... they... The other bit, the digital one just doesn't sound nice at all, you know? Well, you know, you, but Jay, yeah, yes, no. Obviously, it's not nice, not nice for the doctor either having to do it, but... I don't know, my house is lovely. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> no, but you, you are right. It, it's something that us men have a hang up about but literally it was all over in 10 minutes but go and get the bloods done 10 minutes he, or sorry ten, yeah, well, ten, well, sorry not 10 minutes yeah, I suppose, so what are you digging for gold no they, no they ask you questions beforehand you sit down and you, you fill out a questionnaire but no the actual oh, the exam itself. no the actual <laughs> exam itself as far as I can remember it was maybe 20 seconds uh, is all it was so you know it's not what age are you Jay 45 yeah so you know um what, what harm can it do? And early detection is key. So what I would say is go and get the blood test done anyway, okay? Ah, yeah, well, I'm going to look into that already. Yeah, do. Thanks very much, Jay. And uh, to all the other men who have uh, been texting us in saying that they are going to go and get it done. As I said, I'm not a medical professional. I'm not giving out medical advice. But the one thing I will say is that early detection is key and anybody will tell you that. Uh, anyway, uh, thanks to the Marie Kriketian Foundation to do great work uh, for launching that campaign, Stand Up For Your Prostate. 98 FM's Dublin Talks. 98 FM's Dublin Talks with Jeremy Dixon here for a Tuesday morning. Now, after the break, I want you to remember back to your wedding night, if you got married, and ask you a question. Did it happen on your wedding night? 
Text me now to 0877 98 98 98. A simple yes or no. Did you do the deed on your wedding night? I have a fascinating story for you after the break and some figures about how many couples actually don't end up consummating the marriage on their wedding night. So text me now. Text yes or no. Simple yes or no to 0877 98 98 98. Was your wedding night all that it was cracked up to be? 98 FM's Dublin Talks for a Tuesday morning. It's just 11 o'clock. In the next hour, we'll be talking about your wedding night and what happened or didn't happen on your wedding night. And also, kids who are fussy eaters, we'll be hearing from a woman who says that parents need to stop being snowflakes when it comes to their kids' eating habits. But uh, first, here's Sarah Jane with the top stories. Thanks, Jeremy. Good morning. A disco at the Doll has been organised for this afternoon in protest against Mike Pence's visit here. Amnesty Ireland organised the dance demonstration in protest at the American Vice President President's views on abortion and LGBTQ rights. Meanwhile, the White House has said the fact that the Vice President is meeting with the Taoiseach and his partner today shows he's not anti-gay. Consumers have been warned that the cost of online shopping is going to increase after Brexit. The Competition and Consumer Protection Commission is also warning that EU laws which govern when and why you can return goods will not apply to anything bought online in the UK after October 31st. Dublin is to get five new Gwales Scullina. The Education Minister has amended rules for the establishment of new primary schools. According to today's independent newspaper, if there's no existing Irish language school in an area, any new primary school will now automatically be a Gwales school. And an Irish pharmacy has announced that it will pay the VAT on condoms in all of its stores. Care Plus Pharmacy, which has 60 branches around the country, is aiming to promote a culture of safe sex and they don't want price to be a barrier. The company will also donate 5,000 condoms to student bodies for distribution on college campuses. And now you're up to date on 98. 98 FM's Dublin Talks. Call 6797 Don't you go anywhere, Sir Jane. I have a question um, for you. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> why, do, why do you look nervous? Why? Because you're asking. <laughs> yeah. Are you married? So you are married. I am. You? You I'm, are ta- married. I'm ten years married. This ten year. years yeah. married. So can you remember back to your wedding night? Yeah, it was a long time ago. Do you want, do you want to? Do you want to <laughs> remember back to it? Um, did it happen for you on the wedding night? Would you get off the stage? What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Like I'm going to talk about that. No, I'm not going to. No, okay, I won't <laughs> ask you. But what percentage of uh, couples would you believe? Uh, I'd say more don't than do. It's pretty much down the line, actually. Uh, really? Yeah, 50, 52% do, 48% don't. Wow. Yeah. And, I'm surprised uh, at that now. Yeah, but some of the reasons that they give, I mean, I suppose you're tired on the day. It's a long old day, long isn't day, it? Long day. A lot day. of drink consumed in, in a lot of circumstances, you know. Yeah, a lot can happen. Uh, yeah. How important is it, though? I'd say it's pretty important, yeah. Yeah, for me it was. She's not going to give the answer, by the way. <laughs> Don't, listen, I'll get the answer from her in the next 20 minutes. Text you me. Will, yeah. Text you me will, yeah. Text me. Okay, thanks very much. Okay. It's 98 FM's Dublin Talks with Jeremy Dixon here for a Tuesday morning. Now, I have a question for you. The same question I just asked uh, Sarah Jane, who was very... She's not normally shy, by the way. You're not. Get away. <laughs> Because apparently most people on their wedding uh, night, um, well, the, sorry, most people on their wedding night do end up consummating their marriage, according to figures out today. However, a shocking 48% of people actually don't, which was surprising to me. And the re- this came up as a conversation uh, during our lunch yesterday up in the 98 FM canteen. Yeah, that's the kind of stuff that we talk about in the canteen. And um, I was saying about the importance of, uh, well, the importance of it happening on your wedding night. And the rest of the people were saying, well, no, it's not really important. It's not really important. This is uh, figures out according to the VOW, which is a wedding uh, website. 52% of people did do the do on their wedding night. 48% of uh, people didn't. Uh, The reasons given uh, for not uh, consummating the marriage, as it was called back in the day, either too tired, too drunk, or not going back to the hotel room at the same time, which I feel, that seems bizarre to me, that uh, on your wedding night, that you wouldn't go back to the hotel room together. That is the one night, I believe, that you should go back to uh, to the room together, hand in hand, as a husband and wife. It's bizarre that that wouldn't happen. Anyway, I want to hear from you. Text or WhatsApp me, 0877 98 98 98. 0877 98 98 98. Or better still, call me on 67 97 
6797981. 6797981. It's a simple question. Remember back to your wedding night. Did it happen for you on your wedding night? And how important is it? And here's my take on it. I'm, I'm, seeing as I'm asking your opinions, I'll give my opinion on it. Here's my t- take on it. Uh, we did. Uh, I made sure that it happened uh, on the wedding night because I thought it was important. What is the point in the whole day, in the whole marriage thing, uh, on the day if you're not going to top it off with, you know, a bit of nucky at the end of it? I just think it's an anticlimax if you end up getting too drunk and end up going to bed and falling asleep. I think that's a, that's a bit ridiculous. So I think it is very important. I can understand why some people don't do it, but I want to hear your reasons if you didn't and your reasons if you did. So text or WhatsApp me, 0877 98 98 98. Better still, call us on 67 97 98 1. Are you in the 48% of people who didn't do it on your wedding night. What was your excuse? I hope you have a, uh, a good excuse because uh, I don't think there is any excuse. Unless you're sick. Unless you had the fish for dinner and it made you absolutely sick. That is the only reason uh, for not doing it on your wedding night. Because let's be honest, it only takes uh, a couple of minutes. But I just think it's nice to be able to say 20 years down the line or 30 years down the line, you know, yes, my wedding night was special. And when we got back to the room, we had some intimacy. Intimacy is very important uh, in a marriage. Okay, I'm sounding like Dr. Phil now. Shut up, Jeremy. Uh, Ashling, how are you? You're on 90LFM. How are things? Hi, how are you? Not too bad. Good. Now, are you in the 52% that did or the 48% that didn't? We didn't. So we did, actually didn't get to bed till about 7 that morning. So it was kind of that morning. Seven. So- Sorry, how did you not get to bed? Uh, I'm a bit of a dry, you know what? And uh, I was, yeah, you are. <laughs> yeah, no, I am. So my wedding night obviously wasn't as wild as yours. How did you end up staying up till seven o'clock on your wedding night? Uh, just loads of people came back to our room and stuff like that. So it was only in March, so it was only a couple of months ago. So we had loads of people coming back to our room, and then we were like, you know, what, let's get out. So you invited oh, yeah. you invited people back to the bridal suite. Yeah, well, it just happened. They all just followed us. And- <laughs> no, no. Yeah. Never invite these people. The bridal suite is, it's its sacred. You're not supposed to invite guests back. <laughs> well, we had loads of drinks, so we said, you might as well come back for that party. So the party in the, the bridal suite went on till 7 o'clock in the morning? Yeah, and then they all got kicked out. And what state were you in at 7 o'clock uh, in the morning? Uh, it wasn't too good. <laughs> but finally, sick for sure, look, we did it. And that's, oh, so yeah. it, it ended up happening at 7 o'clock in the morning, did it? Yeah, it did. And was it important? Was it important for you? Uh, because obviously at 7 o'clock in the morning, you were probably wrecked tired, um, you know. Like, it wasn't one of a priority thing, like, well, we got married, we have to do it straight away. It was just like, ah, oh, come on, let's, you know. So you just, you, you, just did it, you just did it for the sake of doing it then? Not for the sake of it, but like it's not like you're so tired from your day, you're on the go, and you're like, you know what? We well, just like I know friends that got married and it took them like three or four days afterwards before they did. So, by the way, do you work in a dog kennel? No. <laughs> where, where, where are all these dogs barking from? Oh, I just, oh, I'm just in a park. Oh, you're in, okay. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, it is a long day, and especially for the woman. The woman has to get up a lot earlier than the man because you have to get your hair done and your makeup done and all that, whereas a man can just arrive uh, at the at the wedding. So I would imagine, um, well, you obviously have some staying power that you were able to stay up till 7 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, and I was up at 3 o'clock that morning, the day before, the, the morning of my wedding. The bridesmaids had me awake that early. But at least you can say now you never thought that night back in March when you were when you were uh, having sex uh, on the morning of your wedding. You never thought that you'd be telling uh, uh, an no. audience on the radio. No. But at no. least, but at least you can say it loud and proud that yes, you you did actually do it. I think it's something that you should take your hat off to that you were you were yeah. able to do it. But can and I just like most most of my friends have asked us, oh, hey, but you haven't, and my husband's all like, yeah. Oh, sorry, the, the the friends ask you afterwards, did they? Yeah. Yeah. I suppose, yeah. yeah. I suppose that's a normal thing to ask. Thing, like, yeah. Yeah. Suppose, you know. Thanks very much, Ash. No problem. Cheers, you. bye-bye. Uh, I've never heard of that before about inviting uh, all the uh, wedding guests back to the uh, to the bridal suite. That seems bizarre. Keep the calls coming in. 6797981. 6797981. Or text or WhatsApp us on 0877 989898. Tell us about your wedding night. What happened 
or what didn't happen. We're talking about a, a report on a wedding website, The Vow, which found that 52% of people do have sex on their wedding night, 48% don't. And we want to find out if you didn't, why don't you, or why didn't you? Like, what excuses uh, are there? Let's have a listen to this WhatsApp voice note from Steve. Jeremy, my wife and I never got to go to bed, actually, on our wedding night. We were having too good of a time. I think it was about 10 o'clock before people started going to bed. Sorry, 10 a.m. in the morning, is it? My God. Okay, our wedding was obviously fairly uh, fairly subdued compared to some weddings. And I'm at work, so can't chat, says this person. Uh, I didn't remember that we did it until my husband reminded me of the mirrors around the bed. He wasn't very happy. Jeez, what sort of bridal suite was that that they had mirrors uh, around the bed? Uh, and to be honest with you, if you can't remember uh, doing it on the wedding night, uh, then it probably wasn't very good uh, at all. Keep those texts and WhatsApps coming in. 87 Um I did it on my wedding night, uh, but begrudgingly, says uh, this text message, I was so, so tired. It was four o'clock in the morning. It's such a long day. I think there's too much pressure uh, put on people to uh, to do it. No, but there's no pressure. Who's putting you uh, under pressure? And here's another text message. You won't believe me, but as I said, I was 45 minutes late for the church. Um as I didn't want to marry my then husband. Oh my God, okay, this is uh, interesting. Uh, We didn't consummate our wedding as I couldn't stand the sight of him. I can't come on air as I'm working in a creche. Well, that was a marriage that was, uh, if you can't stand the sight of your husband or your wife on the wedding night and you've no interest in doing it with them, you probably shouldn't have got married in the the first place. Um, I didn't do it on my wedding night, uh, says Tina. My excuse... (laughs) I didn't want the guests downstairs to know what we were doing in the wedding suite. That's absolutely ridiculous. What age are you? 18. You're an adult. Everybody knows that when a, a husband and wife um, go up to the wedding suite on the wedding night, that that's what's going to happen. Uh, Con says in his text message, uh, Jeremy, uh, we had kids uh, first, so we didn't get a chance uh, to do it. Well, I assume the kids weren't in the, uh, in the wedding room. Uh, or in the bridal suite with you. So, you know, that's no excuse uh, at all for that. Keep those texts coming in, some great stories. Um, Oh, Carol says, uh, now Carol has a valid excuse for not doing it. She says, um, I was six and a half months pregnant on twins, uh, so I was so tired that I didn't get a chance to do it. Okay, that's, uh, that's a valid excuse, is it not? Yeah, I'll accept that excuse, Carol. 67979081 67979081 text or whatsapp is 0877989898 if you just joined us we're talking about the wedding night and whether or not you uh, had sex on your wedding night and how important it is to actually have sex on your wedding night because uh, 50% just over 50% of people do 48% of people don't and as I said before, I think it's, and I'm not judge, judging you if you didn't, but to be honest with you, on your wedding day, you shouldn't get that drunk anyway that you can't perform. Uh, it's so important that you do uh, make the space. Uh, we were so tired, says Tony, and with a few beers, we f- we fell asleep mid-act. Oh, she's a lucky woman, Tony. Uh, I'm sure that was the, the happiest day of her life, um, that she couldn't even last for the two minutes that you were supposed to last for. That's what happens when you get drunk. Uh, Kevin says, uh, the thing is that nowadays couples are having sex before marriage unlike our parents uh, did. So uh, having Nucky on their wedding night uh, definitely did happen. Yes, originally that was the reason, is that uh, that was the first time that you did it. And in fact, Kevin, that is your point, that it's not as big a deal nowadays, is it? Uh, no, no, no. It's exa- look, it's, times have moved on. My parents, probably your parents, they, they caught us. They got engaged, you got married, and, and there was nothing of that. <laughs> they were chaperoned, and that night would have been their, what's it called, consum- consum- Con- consummation con- the marriage. Con- yeah. Consummating the marriage. So it's, like, so, it's, it happened. so it's not as important now, is it not? No, no, no. Because they're, no. This is not, because it would have been so built up in their own heads that it was going to happen. But do you, but do you like not think... You, okay, yeah, nobody gets married now, but I don't think anybody gets married nowadays and has sex for the first time on their wedding night. I think you've done it, like, years, no, years there before. there are certain religions in, religions in America. Yes, okay, but... That doesn't exist. So, here. is it not important now, then? I don't think it is. I think the whole... The, the, the importance is all uh, circled around the actual planning, the wedding day. That's... I think that's... It's, it's drifted in relation to... Uh, it's very religious, 
in our parents' day, and so it's taken more seriously. But this is all now more concentrated about the people planning as you're having a conversation recently. And I think that drives them, and the, the excitement of thought of consummating a marriage is it's kind of out the window. Jeez, lads, we're not talking about running a, a marathon. Stay there for a second, Kevin. Let's have a listen to uh, Gary's excuse why it didn't happen. I'm sorry I can't talk. Me, me and my missus got married there in Vegas back in November, but everything was great until we got into the bed and she fell asleep. It's a great night. I went back down gambling. <laughs> oh my God, that's unbelievable. That's what happens when you get married in Vegas. <laughs> Let me have a listen to that again. That's hilarious. Hey, I'm sorry I can't talk. Me, me and my missus got married there in Vegas back in November, but everything was great until we got into the bed and she fell asleep. It's a great night. I went back down gambling. That is the most unromantic wedding night I've ever, ever heard of, Gary. <laughs> She's up in the bed, uh, out cold, and you're down in the casino gambling away on your wedding night. Now, as I said, there's most, most men listening to go, that sounds like a great wedding night, but uh, it's not very romantic. Tina! On my wedding night, there was absolutely no way that I was going to do the bold deed where all of the guests still downstairs drinking and them thinking, oh, oh, they're doing it up there. Oh, no, that wasn't going to happen. Not on my watch. <laughs> what? So you were afraid that your wedding guests uh, would, would judge you? That's absolutely crazy. Daryl. Morning, Jerry B. Uh, I'm not coming on now to talk about this, but I am just sending in this message. I'm not bloody getting back into things, but uh, if it was a day that I could take back, I would, because anybody who says that you can't get drunk at your own wedding, I wouldn't believe that because I didn't even remember going to bed. Uh, I just remember being woke up the next morning with my brother-in-law standing there filming me with the video camera. Uh, <laughs> but um, when myself and my wife did uh, get around the things, um, I got a beautiful daughter out of it anyway, so happy days. Ah, oh, well, that's lovely. So your daughter was uh, pretty much made uh, from the, the first time you had sex after you got married. That's lovely. That's very special. Now, I'd love to know what the story was about the uh, the fella having the, the video camera or whatever. That seems a bit bizarre. Uh, Keith says, we didn't do it as she was too drunk uh, and my six-year-old was left behind by the person supposed to mind him and he ended up in the room with us, says Keith. No, you shouldn't ever. Uh, it's the one night, even if you have kids before you get married, you should leave the child with a babysitter who's going to actually look after them uh, rather than uh, worrying. You shouldn't have to worry about your child on your wedding night and your child shouldn't be spending uh, the night in the bridal uh, suite with you because um, it's just a night that you should be together. Why do we need to do it on our wedding night, says this person? That's old-fashioned. People don't wait till they get married anymore. Uh, Me and my wife were together for 10 years and two kids before we got married. No, I understand that and I understand that we're living in a different world nowadays. I just think and that it is important. Okay, finally, Jean, she went first. Hey, Jeremy, myself and my husband, we got married in 2004 and we consummated our marriage on the day, so much so that we went up to our room before we had our meal. Then again, we went up later on that evening and then the very next morning. So nice and romantic. Sorry, I can't talk. I'm about to drive my car. Sorry, I'm just trying to... Rachel, did you add that up? How many times was that? Was that three? That was three times on the wedding day. Okay, Jean, well done. You are the master. You've put us all to shame. That's absolutely unbelievable. Uh, you managed three times. Uh, I only managed, uh, what was it? Uh, three minutes. That's all it was. So it just shows you. <laughs> Thank you very much for all your calls, your comments and your texts. 98 FM. And I'm sure that's, uh, for those of you listening to the show at the moment, I'm sure that's something you will all discuss with your friends later on. You'll be asking them. Do ask your friends when you see them later on. Ask them, did they do it on their uh, their wedding night? I don't think people are offended when you ask them that kind of uh, question. It's 98 FM's Dublin Talks with Jeremy Dixon. Something completely different after the break. All to do with children who are fussy eaters. And whether or not, as parents nowadays, we've become too snowflakey. We're going to hear from a woman who was disgusted with her sister and the way her sister treats her children. They're fussy eaters and she cooks them whatever they want. We'll be delving into that straight after the break. Don't go away. The sound of the city from Sally Noggin to Swords. Dublin Talks. 98FM's Dublin Talks. Uh, in a moment, we're going to be talking about fussy eating. But before that, I just had to go to uh, Ava. We were talking before the break about the uh, the wedding night stories. And 
Ava, your story, I have to say, stands out like a, like a sore, uh, sore thumb, and we just had to speak to you. And now, it was many, many years ago when you got married, but tell us about what happened yeah. after, the, after the events, you know, the, the speeches and the disco and all that. What happened? Oh, well, we wanted to carry on, obviously, so we did. And so, um, I don't know what time, because it's so long ago, um, had all the young ones, like ourselves, up to the, to the honeymoon suite and put in an order for about 27 bottles of beer. And uh, when the waiter arrived, they all hid in the, in the, in the toilet, <laughs> in the bathroom. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we carried on to the early hours. But we did fit in the confirmation eventually so you invited pretty much a load of the guests back to your honeymoon suite yeah it just sort of happened you know yeah yeah well it doesn't like, just, it doesn't just happen you have to tell them what room number you're at and stuff like that before you know um well, but, true enough <laughs> so you had them all back in the room um you ordered 27 bottles of beer and the waiter arriving obviously thought they were just for you all your guests so you have 20 people hiding in the in the bathroom yeah yeah Yes. giggling away at, I mean obviously the waiter didn't give a damn but we were afraid that they might be all kicked out you know so they were in there kind of as I say giggling away and got the 27 bottles of beer and we were grand we went for another few hours and what time did you finally get all the guests out of the, out of the room at? <laughs> I'm not sure but I know it was uh, maybe 4 or 5 o'clock I suppose yeah that's brilliant and going by the text I didn't realise this was a thing but seemingly it's the big thing now to invite your guests back to the wedding room absolutely brilliant <laughs> well I'm going back about 30 years ago now well it was a right? thing then as well thanks Ava no problem cheers bye bye I just wanted to finish off with that story I thought it was hilarious all the people hiding in the jacks uh, of the of the bridal suite absolutely brilliant 98 FM Dublin Talks I have a question for you. Have you a child who is a fussy eater and won't eat anything out of the ordinary? Bizarrely, this is a topic we've never discussed on the show. But there are lots of parents listening now at the moment who have children that will only eat pizza or they'll only eat toast or they'll only eat cereal. How do you deal with this problem? And do you believe that nowadays parents are far too easygoing when it comes to fussy eating kids? Years ago, when I was growing up, and I'm sure when you were growing up as well, uh, you were sent to bed hungry if you didn't eat what was put in front of you. So on Monday, it might be stew. And I used to hate stew on a Monday. But in our house, it was uh, stew on Monday. And I'd arrive home from school and have it have the, the stew that evening. And it was put in front of me. There was no choice. Back in the day, your mother would never say to you, um, well, do you want fish? Do you want fish or beef? Like It wasn't like a wedding reception. you know. Would you like beef or chicken, sir? It was put in front of you. And you ate what was put in front of you. And if you didn't eat it, you didn't get anything else. That was years ago. Things have changed now. Because parents nowadays are snowflake parents. Well, this is according to this listener who got in contact with us, Hannah. And I want you to have a listen to the Facebook message she sent us. Because it's an interesting debate. And uh, it's interesting because only figures released last week in the UK show that around a quarter of preteens are fussy eaters and will eat very little that's put in front of them. Are you a parent of a fussy eater? I'd like to hear from you. Text or WhatsApp us 87 or call us on 67 Do you agree with what Hannah is saying in her message? Here's what she says. Please don't give out my second name or I'll be killed. Ha! Now you'll understand why now because she's about to give out about her sister. You need to talk about parents like my sister. She has two children aged five and seven. They don't eat anything. They're so fussy. Anytime she makes them nice dinners, they refuse to eat it or spit it out. I've actually been there to witness this. So you know what she does? She gives in. She goes back into the kitchen to make them something different. I told her to cop on. When the two of us were kids, we were left hungry if we didn't eat what was given to us. What the hell is wrong with parents nowadays? She says you can't force children to eat food if they don't like it. By the way, they ended up having tea, or they ended up having toast with jam last Sunday when I was there because they wouldn't eat the roast dinner that she made for them. Ridiculous, says Hannah. So there's Hannah giving out about her sister. Her sister has uh, two children, aged five and seven. And like a lot of children, they're fussy eaters. And um, Hannah is, well, Hannah's sister is basically giving in to their every demand and going back into the kitchen and making them stuff. And uh, I don't know, is sending children to bed hungry nowadays, is that not acceptable anymore? 
Um, is that actually child abuse? Because it was done on all of us. We did not have a choice. The question I'm asking you is, are parents nowadays too too easygoing and too snowflakey when it comes to their children's uh, their, their children's diets? Should parents be giving them options and saying, oh, okay, oh, you know, little John doesn't like stew, so I'll, I'll do another dinner for you, John. You don't want stew? No problem. I'll put some fish fingers in the oven for you. I think that's absolutely ridiculous, parenting. I really do. Um, you know, no one is born not liking food. Okay, you're not, you don't come out of the womb hating mushrooms or broccoli. It doesn't happen. So you just need to put the foot down. That would be my tuppence worth, anyway. I'd love to hear from you. Call us, 67979811. Text or WhatsApp us, 0877989898. Now, Siobhan O'Neill from mams.ie, your 12-year-old is a bit of a fussy eater. She is. How, how fussy is fussy now? Well, she wouldn't be great on eating like a, like a full dinner. She'll have her bit of her mash and gravy, but she's great with vegetables and fruit. So where she's not good sometimes on her starchy foods, um, if she doesn't eat all her dinner, <clears throat> she'll be like, "Mom, I'm sorry, I just it's too much for me. I can't finish it." She'll tr- she'll give it a try, but she doesn't like everything. She doesn't like chicken or turkey, so she's a bit fussy in that way. But she, instead of me, instead of asking me to make her something else, she'll say, "Can I have a slice of watermelon, or can I have um, an apple or an orange?" So she'll eat some of it, and then she'll go straight for the fruits. And the veg afterwards, she'd eat like a chopped up pepper or something like that. But that, I, 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 that's that's quite good. Uh, yeah, I think I think, I think you're very lucky. But what would you do if she only wanted pizza? And I, I have no. I have friends who have kids like this, and they literally live off a diet. It's disgusting. They live off a diet of waffles and and fish fingers no, and pizza. Not on. You know, we have to educate our children. There's an obesity crisis in this country. Children are getting far too much sugar. We've, look, we've and I've been guilty of that over the summertime. They had far too many ice creams, you know, yeah. 99s on the sunny days and all that kind of stuff. It's supposed to be a treat. So Monday to Friday, day to day, I try to make healthy dinners. So that my kids actually love stew. They love coddle. They love casseroles, all that kind of stuff. So they will eat that kind of thing. Um, if one of them, if I know they're not mad about a certain thing, I'll put on a vegetable that I know that they like, but I'll do it for everybody. So if like one of them doesn't really like peppers and if there's peppers going into the casserole, I'll make sure that I do broccoli with it because he loves broccoli. And when he was small, Mitchell, he's 16 now, we used to say to him, we made a game out of it. Broccoli, it's like eating a tree. Can you get all the branches off the tree? So from when he was very small, he would walk around eating his vegetables because we didn't give him any other choice. This is the food that we gave to him from when he was a baby. And he ate everything when he was small. And then they they did, there's a kind of a funny story, they did this initiative in schools called Food Dudes, where they were trying to encourage children to eat more fruit and vegetables. They did it a few years ago. And they came into his school and he's very competitive. And if he was to eat, if he was to try the food, he got a reward. So they put, say, five pieces of fruit and vegetables. Which is always great, yeah. Rewards are always great. And the reward was a pencil and a pencil pairer with food dudes written on it. And he's very competitive. But this is ridiculous. Some of the food was raw turnip. Jesus. Now, why would you give raw turnip to a child? I wouldn't give raw turnip to a dog. Right. It's hard enough to get them to eat mashed turnip. So raw turnip, uh, cucumber, peppers... Um, raw potato they had one day just to, just to get them to try it but he was so upset about the cucumber and the turnip that he actually made himself sick because he forced himself to eat it because he thought he'd get the prize if he did it so that for me was a total disaster because then he started to say I'm not eating turnip anymore I'm not eating cucumber anymore don't put that in the salad so I don't but I don't put cucumber in the salad anymore and I won't cook turnip because he had such an adverse reaction like he thinks he's allergic but he's not so you have to be careful that you don't force them into eating things that I think it's unreasonable to expect a child to eat raw turnip I, whoever came up with that idea obviously has no kids or brains or common sense it was a stupid thing to do and it turned him completely off that food the same um, with the cucumber they forced him kind of to eat it and he just won't eat it since so that actually made a lot of kids turn off certain fu- fruits and vegetables and it was, I don't think they ran that initiative very well. But in our house, from when they were very small, they had curries, they had rice, they had pasta, everything we were having, they were having. And I would tone down the spices when they were small, but they'd have a little bit of spice. 
So when we go out to dinner as a family, my kids don't go, uh, can I have sausage and chips off the kids' menu? We have never, ever done that. They'll have carbonara. Or we went out for lunch. Yeah, there's a lot more options now on kids' menus than they're they're ever... So let let me ask you you a question. Um, If a child refuses to... Like the situation with Hannah's sister, where the child is spitting out the... I don't want that. I don't want that. Is Hannah's sister doing the completely wrong thing by by going running back into the kitchen and cooking them something differently? Well, like t- like t- toast with jam is not a dinner. No. So no. I actually feel sorry for that girl because she's probably cornered herself now where they think if we complain loud enough, we'll get what we want. Um, she probably needs to put her foot down. I mean, ro- my kids, roast dinner is one of the best dinners you can give them. It's so homely. Even, I know, like, when my husband goes away for work, my mum will say... Do you want to come down for Sunday roast and the potatoes and the chicken? I feel so looked after and minded. It's such a nourishing thing to give your child, I think. So for them not to like that, not to like things like mash and gravy and stuff, I don't know how I'd cope if my children didn't eat that kind of food. I'd be snookered. Um, <laughs> me me, me neither, to be honest. Sorry? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know how to cope as well. I'm very, no. I'm very lucky. Stay there for a second, please, uh, Siobhan. That's Siobhan O'Neill from mams.ie. Um, you know, she, she has children. She has a 12-year-old that's a bit of a fussy eater, but not much of a fussy eater. The question I'm asking, uh, are parents too easygoing when it comes to the way their children eat? Let me go to uh, Santry next. Anne, how are you? Hiya. How are things? Now, your kids, you're old school, like I suppose my parents would have been. Uh, they eat what's put in front of them. And if you don't eat it, you starve. And is that the way? Is that the way you operate in your house? Oh yeah, because uh, my ma do not know. So we didn't like all our stuff when we were growing up. Uh, the likes of liver and um, what else would it be? Ham and vegetables and all that. We were all made either. And if we didn't, like we'd be sitting there until it's gone cold. And um, we'd be made either. And if we didn't eat it, she'd make sure to heat it up for us a few hours later. Not out of a microwave. Now it'd be on a pot. So what, 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 happen, what happens in your what happens in your house if you put something in front of your kids and they say no I'm not eating that that's disgusting. Like I I, I do I try and get around them because there's one that doesn't like Brussels sprouts and I just say it's broccoli and he pick at it and he and he goes that's that's a bit funny the taste it doesn't taste and I say yeah just eat it I put gravy on top of it but there is too much uh, people people are listening to their kids the kids aren't the one cooking the dinner you should just be made to eat what you're given look at some kids they've nothing. You know what I mean? And you're wondering then why. I wonder why my kids are fat. Well, here's the money. You can go off and buy a McDonald's if you don't want your dinner or order in a chipper. Yeah, just giving in. Or a pizza. See, there's two. And see, parents don't want to cook today either. Yeah, well, let me, uh, do you think that's a, that's a part of it as well, Siobhan, that parents are lazy nowadays? They are. Well, look, I mean, I've got four kids and I'm working and I try and cook a dinner, particularly Monday to Friday, because my husband, I, I work from home a fair bit. So, yeah, I mean, there's days when I think, oh, the last thing I want to do now is cook a dinner. Oh, yeah. But I do feel, if I'm at home, I feel it is, it's my responsibility to cook them a dinner and to yeah. cook them something that is good for them. They all play sports. They all play Gaelic. Three or four nights a week, they're out training. And I want them to have something healthy and decent in them before they go training. So plenty of veg. And like, you know, sometimes if I make a lasagna, I blend up the courgette because they all think they hate courgette, but they eat it all the time. Yeah, they won't know if it's blended up. They don't know if it's blended in. So I kind of hide the vegetables sometimes in the dishes and they go, God, mum, that was lovely. And let me ask you a question, uh, Anne. Uh, have your kids ever gone to get bed hungry because they didn't eat what was put in front of them? Oh, yeah, they have. Oh, really? And it done them no harm because it done me no harm. No, it didn't do... Well, I can imagine. No, it didn't do me any harm uh, oh, at the moment. I think it's the end of the world. It's like the internet. You know, if that's not working, they all have a heart attack. Because I'm the just... Same a... thing. I just go, yeah, get over it. Because, but let me read out a message for you, Anne. Yeah. Uh, and you knew you were going to get a message like this. Uh, that woman, Anne, is a disgrace. Um, children should never go to bed hungry. Ah, that's you know what? That's a joke. There's people out there that have nothing today, and their kids are starving. I've stuffed there, but you won't be allowed to touch it. They need their dinner for me. End of story. You don't eat your dinner, you don't get fed, and they have to know that. But the, nowadays you're dealing with different parents, and they. Ah, well, do you know what it is? It's all. It's all. They're all watching too much telly. That's what it is. They all think they're living in the Kardashian age. <laughs> but they are living in the Kardashian age. So your kids have actually gone to bed really, really hungry because they ah, haven't eaten. You, no, he's not. You get your. Well, no, I'm not saying starving. But... Evening, okay. He's going to get lunch and that beforehand. He'll eat the lunch and then they'll have a little moan at the dinner. I just say, you don't want your dinner. Get out. 
I don't. And it's not a bottle on them. No, you're right. Stay there for a second. That's Anne. Uh, a lot of people not happy with her. That woman is a disgrace. Sending her be- her children to bed hungry. Um, you f- see, I can see parents now listening to this. New age parents. You know all these new age parents. Uh, some of you are new age parents. And you're listening to this now. You know these new age parents that don't think you should shout at children. And the bold step is a bad thing and all this. You know all these parents that read too many books. They're all experts in parenting. And I can hear them now listening to the show and listening to what Anne is saying and saying, oh my God, that's disgraceful, sending your, your child to, to bed hungry. I think she has the right idea if they won't eat the food. So, as she says, it did us no harm. Uh, let me go to Kulak next. Mick, how are you? All right, Jeremy, how's it going, mate? Not bad, yeah. Um, do you think uh, parents take the easy way out as well? Yeah, definitely, yeah. Most definitely. Uh, because, like, cause especially with the technology age and all that, like, parents are too busy on your iPhones and watching reality bullshit TV and stuff and all that, like... And, uh, and I see, uh, like, every time I go to Northside after school or something like that, if I'm going through it there, the McDonald's is absolutely rammed with parents with kids. So where's the McDonald's packed? Which one? In, uh, in Northside Shopping Centre. Oh, Northside Shopping Centre, OK. Yeah, because m- m- cause most of these parents are ma- mainly bone idle. They just can't be asked to do... Oh, so what? Parents in Coolock aren't cooking dinners for their kids, would you stop? No, well, people take your kids to McDonald's after school rather than cook a meal for them. Well, no, um, it should be only ever uh, taken, uh, that sort of uh, treat should be once, maybe a month or whatever, McDonald's. Yeah, but like, it seems to be like, every time I go past, I past the school, it's the same parents there taking their kids to McDonald's because it's convenient. These are lives too... Is the only way for them. Yeah, but you don't happen to have a child that uh, that is a fussy eater. Stay there for a second, Mick, because uh, I think. It, and you're from Kulak yourself, are you? Well, that's where you live. I'm living in Kulak, yeah. He's just a brave man. <laughs> He's basically dissing all the parents in Kulak for feeding their kids uh, McDonald's. I'd like to hear from you. Text or WhatsApp us 0877 98 98 98 or call us on 6797 981. Here's a WhatsApp voice note from Roisin. My son is brilliant now. He's a teenager now, and all it's all I can do to keep him fed. But when he was smaller, oh, he was very fussy. Or, um, like if he was having uh, something, he'd have to have it in a set. We'd have to have his vegetables in a separate bowl beside maybe his potatoes. Like the food, none of the food could touch it, touch each other. Oh God, I remember that now. When we were so funny like that. Kids are strange, aren't they? Here's Dave. Hey Jeremy, just on the uh, vegetables there. I have two lads, and uh, one's uh, one's nine and one's six, and they're they're not great now with their vegetables. They eat like you know a bit and all, but they they but like if you were having lasagna or anything like that, they wouldn't really eat it. So I found out that uh, if you get all the vegetables, I blend them all up and I, I make them into the sauce, literally. So so they get into the that way. And it's a good hack, yeah. At all, like, um, like I do have like there's no way my lads would eat a broccoli like no not in a million years but uh, you know when you're making the sauce for your uh, bolognese or whatever if you put it into the blender and just blend it up it just looks like the sauce then you know so at least to be getting it into them that way cheers bye ok there's a huge reaction to this thanks for that Dave uh, keep the text and whatsapps coming in 87 798 and a lot of reaction uh, to Anne uh, who said that her children not gone to bed starving but her children have gone to bed hungry uh, if they haven't eaten uh, their dinner and a lot of support coming in for you as well Anne and let's try and gauge uh, you as a parent if you're a parent gauge how much support Anne has I think she's she's dead right you know she's not giving in to her children's needs you know and once again what she said was if her children don't eat what's put in front of them uh, they go to bed and they go to bed hungry uh, do you support the way Anne uh, parents her children uh, with regards to feeding time do you support what she does is it acceptable yes or no is it acceptable to let your child go to bed hungry because they don't eat their dinner. I'm a new age parent, says this person, and I think Anne is bang on. There you go, Anne. You're you're bang on, Anne. You're bang on. You're doing it the right way. Stay there for a second. We'll take more of your calls after the break. Don't go away. The Sound of the City, from Stony Batter to Stepaside. Dublin Talks. 98FM's Dublin Talks. It's bizarre sometimes on the show. You don't know how things are going to go. Uh, and uh, we were talking to Anne a few minutes ago. Well, this conversation came about uh, with the email from Hannah about her sister, whose two children are fussy eaters, five and seven. And uh, basically, Hannah's sister cooks anything the little kids want. And then we ended up speaking to Anne, uh, as a mother from Santry, who says that her kids will eat what they're given, and if they don't eat, they go to bed hungry. And a couple of text messages. I'll say a couple came in saying she's a disgrace. But I have to say, uh, Anne, in the last five minutes has completely changed 
and you have got so much support. Put it this way, if you came on the air and said you'd ran 10 marathons in 10 days, you wouldn't get as much support and praise as you're after getting now. Um, Everybody support. Anne is a legend. I was brought up the same way. Yeah, uh, the best way. Uh, a new age parent, my arse, says this person. Anne knows the way to do it. That's uh, it. Th- Stay there for a second. Let me go to... Who we go to next? Let me go to Marie. Marie, I love the slogan in your house. What is it? Jesus or wear it. <laughs> Jesus. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, but it, it, sometimes it, it looked good on them. Yeah, yeah no, I agree yeah. with you. Um, and it, has have they ever worn their dinner? Uh, not for long. Okay. Uh, Not for long. The reason I'm asking is it happened to me in my house uh, year, <laughs> years ago. I, I still dread talking about this because it's hurt me so much. Um, it's affected my, my life. But uh, when I was a kid, Marie, I wouldn't eat, uh, you know, tapioca. Tapioca, yeah. is that what it's called? Yeah. Because yeah. uh, it, look, yeah. it looks like frog spawn. It's disgusting. Yeah. And my mother put it in front of me and I wouldn't eat it. And an hour later, I still wouldn't eat it. And she finally threw it uh, over my head. (laughs) uh, We laugh about it now. It's one of those things that we laugh about now. But have you ever thrown dinner over your children? No, I'm not throwing. I mean, the plate sometimes slipped, you know. um, Well, it kind of slipped over the edge. Uh, So... It had to be uh, cleaned up, but it wasn't my doing. But it was them wearing it. So you're a no nonsense. You're a no nonsense uh, parent as well. There's no menus in my house. The, the, the only place you should get a menu is in a restaurant. Yeah, absolutely. No choices for the kids. No, no. But, but there, whatever's there, you eat it. But supposing a child doesn't like mushrooms, okay? I mean, we don't force adults. To, to eat things they don't like. You know, when I get home, um, I I do the cooking, what did I say, Tuesday, I'll be doing the cooking in our house tonight and I'm not going to cook something for my wife um, with mushrooms in it because she doesn't like mushrooms. I'm not, not going to put a, a plate of mushrooms in front of Sue and say, Sue, you have to eat those mushrooms. But no, Jer, I don't like those mushrooms. Eat those mushrooms or you'll be wearing them. So we don't force parents to, or we don't force adults to eat what they don't like. So why should we force children? Well, it's not, no, if, if they don't like them, they can leave them aside. That's absolutely no problem. Supposing you don't like anything on the plate? Give them, the, well, 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 that's tough. As the lady said, Anne, you know, okay, well, we'll see you for breakfast in the morning. <laughs> really? And uh, have your kids gone to bed hungry? No, I don't think so. I think that they, you know, they, I'd sit with them and chat with them so that they'll just finish their dinner without even thinking about it. My mother um, has a, an expression that she used to use, and I'm trying to remember what it is, something about hunger and sauce. Um, so hunger is a good sauce. That's what she used to say, uh, mm-hmm. or hunger is the best sauce. The best sauce, yeah. And doesn't that mean, because I never understood it as a child, she used to say to me, you know, um, you know, I'd say, I'm not eating that, I don't want coddle. And she'd go, oh, you will eat it, hunger is the best sauce. So doesn't that, that means that if, you, if you're hungry enough, you'll eat anything. Of course you will. Of course you will. But you give give children the options. Okay, they're not going to like everything. As you said, you know, you're not going to make them eat mushrooms if they don't like mushrooms. I have one of them and he just eats around them. Sharon in Swords just sent me a photograph of her kitchen here um, and uh, hanging up in her kitchen, Marie, there is a sign in her kitchen and it says, you have two choices, take it or leave it. <laughs> Yeah. And that's pretty yeah. much the way Sharon uh, rules things. Stay there for a second, please, Marie. Six seven nine seven ninety eight one is our telephone number. Text or WhatsApp us oh eight seven seven ninety eight ninety eight ninety eight. We're talking about uh, children who are fussy eaters, and is it okay to um, to let them go to bed uh, hungry? And uh, how do you? Can you force a child to eat food? You probably can't, can you, Gary? You are a supporter of Anne's way of parenting, are you? Yeah, absolutely, Jeremy. Absolutely. And the thing is, it's not only um, that she's feeding the kids, right? She's teaching the kids that she is the parent and she has authority. And then um, they have to listen to her through discipline. She loves her kids. If you love your kids, you're going to raise your kid proper. And sometimes it hurts to punish your kid, but you're doing it for the right reasons. So I support her 100%. Like my mom was old school as well. She used to buy fruit and veg and um, me every day, you know, because it was different back then back in the 80s when I was a little kid and she would cook it every day and we would all piss and moan over different things that we didn't like but you still you still have to eat it do you know what I mean and uh, I remember getting um, a cuddle 
and uh, I used to hate the little bits and stuff like that. But she used to she used to sieve the soup for me. Do you know what I mean? She sieve the soup just so I'd still eat the coddle. Um, and then like the little uh, the barley. Do you remember barley? Be putting um. Uh, stew. Oh yeah, my mother put barley in stew as well. What the, was she the, thinking? The riot, I hated it. Yeah, I disgusting. Well, you drink the soup and then she'd mash it up and it wouldn't be a bother. You and there was, I mean? there was one day she put peas in my shepherd's pie and I was like, no, get those peas out of the shepherd's pie. Um, <laughs> and she had she had to go, and she did, she went back into the kitchen and picked all the peas out. Now, I was 25 at the time, so don't worry about it. But yeah, I agree with you. When you were, when you were a kid, um, you know, you have to kind of put the foot down. So what do you think, you know, you heard that, that guy Mick talking about his local McDonald's packed after school every day with parents bringing their kids to McDonald's and that's what they're getting for dinner. Well, the way you, the way you would see it is now when I assume my own experience, you know, it's just like you have kids raising kids, you know, and it's just the cycle that's gone on now. Why the teenage parent myself? But thank God I had a mother and even the girlfriend that at home mother taught how, taught how to cook, you know, we knew how to cook fresh stuff every day of the week. But not everybody's like that. A lot of people don't know how to cook, you know what I mean? And it's just it's it's, it's actually had a domino effect and like it's getting worse and worse and worse and it comes down to discipline as well. Like. Of course. I don't know if you if you those of you stay there for a second, I don't know if those of you and if you didn't see the story, look up this story. It's all over uh the uh the internet at the moment uh, about a teenager in the UK. It's a horrible, horrible story. A teenager in the UK who was left blind and deaf after living off a diet of chips, crisps and sausages. Um, so he began to lose his hearing at the age of 14 and then his eyesight uh, deteriorated as well and he's now been left with um, basically uh, no life, um, deaf and blind because he spent uh, a 10 years, a decade long diet of sausage, chips, crisps and uh, processed food. And um, I said, this story is after going viral over the last 24 hours, you know, and people are saying the parents uh, should be held accountable for basically rearing their children on, on junk food. And he's 19 now and um, his life is, his health is ruined because of the way his uh, his parents, uh, what just allowed him. A child would eat uh, crap if you allowed them to eat crap. Uh, two uh, quick calls on this. Uh, let's go to Drogheda next. Joanne, you've two kids and um, it's not easy, is it? Um, it's not that it's not easy. As I said, um, my eldest, she's brilliant. I just cook absolutely anything. I love cooking, though, and I think that is the main thing, even though it works. But I find the best thing to do is to batch cook. I have to batch cook every week to make sure everyone gets to dinner. Um, and I kind of just ask them, oh, what what, what she's kind of liked this week and whatnot, and I might make a lasagna or shepherd's pie or something like that. So if I'm not home to cook a dinner... There's, I know there's a good dinner there for them. I really think it's important that they get like a good... Yeah, like and, and you know these parents Joanne who say oh I don't have time I don't have time to cook dinner and you can cook a shepherd's pie on a Sunday and freeze it and they can have a bit of it uh, for, for three of the days of the week yeah like don't get me wrong like there's days I don't want to do it I honestly don't want to stand in the kitchen and cook a dinner but I know that it sets them up for the week and my husband so we both work shift work so there's days where we don't see each other at all but um, it's just nice to know, like uh, the woman earlier on said, like there's just something about having a home cooked meal that Absolutely. makes you feel so comfortable. Of course, you know? it, of course it does. It beats, it beats uh, waffles, and uh, and I'm not saying waffles are bad. I love waffles, but everything in moderation. One final call, uh, Joe. You're about that case in the UK as well. It's it's disgraceful, isn't it? Yeah, well, I, I heard it there earlier on one of the radio stations, and uh, you know what what got me was was that one. Probably United FM. Yeah, we always have these stories yeah. first. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, but what happened was was that when you call us over there and start giving out to your woman saying that's wrong, sending the kids to bed, you know that's child cruelty and all that. Yeah. Like I mean, if if their kids actually turned out like that, what would they be saying? Oh, well, I couldn't get the kid to eat. You know, it's not child neglect and all. And now all of a sudden, these parents that had let this kid just eat all this and go blind, that they might be in trouble. Like, I mean, yeah, yeah, they don't seem to realise what the, the effect is going to be when the kids are like, grown up, you know? No, Just I... Just them junk all the time. I agree with you, Joe. Thanks very much for your call. Sorry for rushing across here. Uh, if you want to read that story, it's online there. Uh, but it's it's just a very sad, shocking story. And it's an indictment of not all parents are like that, but a lot of modern day parents just let their, their children eat crap because it's the, the easy way out. Uh, here's a WhatsApp voice note from Derek. Jeremy, when we were kids, we used to be told, if you don't eat your dinner at five o'clock, you had to go to bed. Oh. Even in the middle of the summer. My mom would say, we're not working so hard to put food in the head for you to waste. So we learned the hard way to eat everything my ma gave you.
And uh, Roisin. And I completely support you that there's too many snowflake parents just taking the lazy way out rather than having to challenge their children a little bit. They're teaching them good eating habits. My two would have puked in the dinner on me. Now, one of mine has autism, but they ver- were very sensory with lumpy food. But you know what? They're great eaters now because it was persistence. It, they may puke over you once or twice or 20 times in my case, but they're great eaters now. That's what it is. It's persistence and uh, not being lazy. And as I said, I'm not the perfect parent, um, but, you know, I do know that a child needs uh, nutrition and needs a good home-cooked meal. Thank you very much for all your calls, your comments and your texts. Huge reaction to that. I'm afraid we're way out of time. I hope you enjoyed the show today. We're back again. Actually, Adrian's back uh, in this seat. I'll be over in the other seat uh, for tomorrow morning show. And if it's something you want brought up on Dublin Talks tomorrow, you can contact us on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Adrian K and Jeremy D. Barry Dunn is up next with some great tunes. Like these. Ninety-eight FM.